Hi, and thanks to one and all for joining our predictive analytics webinar today. We will delve into more of the possibilities or tools that one can utilize with regards to MATLAB and see how they can incorporate these tools to come up with predictive solutions and so forth. Optimum Solutions is based over here and was born out of the University of the Witwe Vatersrand in 1992 and are the sole distributors of MathWorks tools in Southern Africa. Over the years, and particularly in 2015, the company had expanded its wings in a way where we now offer various service solutions to our clients, whether it be collaborative or providing the end user with the tools and trainings to improve their business performance. These services include predictive maintenance, conditional monitoring, process control, financial engineering, advanced business analytics, digital engineering, and more. We are a level four triple BEE entity, and this illustrates our progressive background over here at Optimum Solutions. Our clients vary from a large range of companies, from your financial institutions to banks, your network providers, research institutions, more particularly your universities and even the aero defense space. And with many of these companies listed in the JSC top 40, as you can see over here, we've worked with Sasol, your Anglo America, Medbank, MTN, and many other companies as well. Joining me today is Antti Lotunia, who is a specialist in predictive maintenance and application deployment. He also holds a MSc in information technology. I myself, Hamza Harar, is a software engineer and consultant at Optimum Solutions in South Africa. I've previously also worked as a process design engineer for mineral processing plants and so forth. And currently we are looking at utilizing the MathWorks tools within the smart mining and manufacturing realm. Our smart mining and engineering teams are centered around unlocking profitable insights and solutions to the real world problems using process data. The services offered are typically provided in a collaborative environment where we work together to identify key performance indicators. Subsequently, the data attained from these indicators are utilized to predict process outcomes or to control processes based on predictive analytics conditional monitoring and predictive maintenance. At Optimum Solutions, we incorporate advanced data visualizations, smart monitoring and maintenance and intelligent control to meet our clients' need in an optimized, smart manner. That's it from my side. Anti will now be taking over. Thank you so much. OK, thank you, Hamza. Can you hear me well? Yes, we will be very well. Great, thank you. So yeah, my name is Antti Lodana and I'm a senior application engineer at MathWorks. Um, I'm based uh, in our MathWorks office in Finland, actually, so, and I work across the different Nordic countries with the different customers. Um, and just as Hamza said, I'm focusing on the MATLAB side of things. So um, I focus on data analytics, predictive maintenance, um, and also application deployments and testing measurements as well. So um, in this presentation, uh, what I would really like to convey is basically to show you the different steps in developing predict uh, predictive analytics all the way from um, accessing data, um, tackling large quantities of data and developing AI models and also deploying those um smart applications that you're developing and uh, in doing so i would also like to highlight the latest and greatest matlab features that help you be more productive in in developing those analytics so here's the brief agenda so i'll start by just introducing a few key concepts about data analytics um, and then we'll spend most of our time uh, in MATLAB looking at a case study. And then if time permits, uh, we can have a Q&A session at the end. So 
let's get started. So what do we mean by data analytics? Well, it's a, it's a fairly simple definition. So typically we want to um, find some valuable information in the data and make some smart decisions based on the potentially large quantities of data. And there are different levels of um, data analytics. The most basic level is descriptive analytics, where you typically look into the past and try to understand what happened. Then we have something called diagnostics, uh, which tries to answer the question, why did something happen? Why do we see this phenomena um, in the data? And then we have predictive analytics, uh, which is more forward looking. Uh, we're trying to understand what will happen. Uh, in it could be something like trying to estimate when a piece of machinery might fail. So basically, how much longer can we operate the machinery? Or something like that. And then we have prescriptive analytics, uh, which answers the question, what should be done when we know what might happen? And this is typically um, an optimization problem. So if you're, for example, running or operating power plants, prescriptive analytics would be to optimize the running of the power plants to minimize cost, but still to uh, produce enough energy. And there's typically a certain kind of workflow associated with any kind of data anal analytics. So um, obviously we need to access data. Um, so your data might be stored in files, uh, databases or data warehouse has um, some kind of data historians or even measurement hardware that you might access. And MATLAB can or MATLAB supports a very wide range of uh, different types of data sources. Um, once you can access the data, um, you typically need to clean it. So you need to deal with outliers and missing values. And also sometimes you need to transform the data or organize it in a different way. And once this is done, then you can actually start developing some models. And this is typically where you use techniques like machine learning or deep learning. Um, and as part of this step, you typically also um, tune the hyperparameters of the model and maybe do some, well, you should always do some model validation. Um, and once you have an accurate model and you have tested the model that it works as you intended to work, um, then obviously you want to operationalize that. It doesn't help if the model is living inside your MATLAB environment, you need to deploy it somewhere. And with the MathWorks tools, uh, you can deploy your models into different environments like uh, cloud environments or even embedded systems. And today we're going to mostly focus on uh, the first three steps, but we'll also discuss the last step. Okay, so at this point, let me hop over to my web browser. Um, and what you see here is a web application that allows us to predict the energy demand for different regions within the state of New York in the US. So I can use this map interface to click these different parts of the uh, state of New York, and these different parts are actually diff uh, different parts of the electric grid within the state of New York. And whenever, whenever I click one of these regions, I'm actually calling into a MATLAB application, a MATLAB algorithm that is um, downloading some weather forecasts from the internet. It's downloading some historical uh, energy consumption data, and then it parses this data, cleans it up, uh, organizes the data, and then it feeds the data into um, a neural network model that has been trained in MATLAB. And then it outputs the estimation of the future energy demand for that particular region. And you see that estimation here on the right-hand side of this black vertical line. And on the left-hand side, we see the historical values. So this application allows us to forecast the energy demand uh, for these different regions. And we see that the demand and also the historical values, they, they look a bit different from region to region. So this front end, this is actually developed in Spotfire. So it's not a MATLAB application. It's, it's a third party application from our point of view. Uh, 
but in, in the background, we're actually um, utilizing MATLAB analytics. And this is what we're aiming, aiming to with our discussion today. So we're trying to develop this predictive model, and we want to be able to integrate that to some enterprise applications like this. All right, so I think I can skip this slide. So yeah, basically, basically we want to uh, develop an AI model, an accurate one. We want to test a few different models, and we want to deploy that uh, to production. And actually, you know, before doing any kind of modeling, as you saw in the workflow slide, uh, we need to we need to access data and uh, clean it up. Um, a few details about the model. So what you see here in this graph is basically uh, the energy demand for one of these regions. And we see that it's a very cyclic behavior. And as you can imagine, the energy demand depends on a few different things. So it depends on uh, the current weather conditions, like um, the temperature outside. Uh, it depends on the time of the, the day because, you know, people don't use a lot of electricity during the night. So the uh, overall uh, electricity demand during the night is is lower than during the day and the evening and it's 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 very cyclic so there's a lot of correlation uh, between past values and so on so um, yeah we're going to use these kind of this kind of information as our predictors to the model so weather data things like dry bulb temperature dew point um, time of the day is it a weekday or a weekend um, and these kind of um, information and also the historical lows as well. And then basically our we're hoping that our model can kind of map these different predictor values into an accurate representation of the uh, future electricity demand. OK, so let me hop over to MATLAB here. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to. We're going to do this in a baking show style, so I have this ready made script. And I'm going to run this example by basically uh, running these different sections of this script. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is to access data. And for most type of AI development, we actually need lots of data. And uh, I can actually use MATLAB to download data from the web. Uh, so what I could do is that I could specify the starting and ending date for the data. So the energy data is essentially a time series data. So I can specify um, starting and ending date. So let's say that we want to download data for the year 2019. Um, and then I can use this piece of code. Actually make this slightly bigger. Uh, I can use this piece of code to automatically download the data. And in this case, we can basically put together a URL that points to the, um, the state of New York grid operators web page. And we can basically download zip files uh, from the website. And then using the unzip command, I can unzip. Well, actually, the unzip will download and then unzip the uh, zip files onto my computer disk. So let's do that. And it actually runs very fast because I have already downloaded the data, so it doesn't take too long. Um, so let's have a look at the actual files. So if I just um, print out the contents of this particular folder where I have the data, uh, I now see that I have 365 files. And they are CSV files. And basically, we have one file for each day. So this is the historical uh, energy demand. So this is the January 1st file. This is the January 2nd, and so on. And I actually have one of these files here in the MATLAB um, current directory. So I can open that out, uh, that file outside of MATLAB. And this is what the data looks like when I have downloaded and extracted the files. So we have five different columns. So we have the timestamp. We have the time zone. We have the name of the region. So we actually have 10 or 11 different regions. So we have the data for all of these different regions. Then we have something called PTID. That's the fourth column. And then we have the actual load. PTID is just the numerical indicator for the measurement location. 
So that's what the raw data looks like. And we have 365 of these files. Right, so um, how do I access 365 files? So um, a very convenient way to access large quantities of files or simply just one huge file is to use something called a data store object. So with a data store, you can basically just point to your data location. Uh, so you can specify a folder name and then you can specify that what kind of files are you interested in. And in my case, I'm interested in all the CSV files so I can use this um, wildcard symbol here. Uh, and then I can also specify how do I want to read these different columns in the CSV file. And the first column was the date or the timestamp. So I can specify the formatting, how I want to represent or import this data into MATLAB as a date time. Uh, the next two columns I want to treat as a categorical variable. And then the next two columns I want to treat as just floating point numbers. And for our analysis, we don't actually need the PT ID or we don't need the time zone. So we can basically, using the data store object, um, I can specify the column names that, I'm, that I want to import and read into MATLAB's memory. So let's run this section. Uh, never mind the warnings, they're just uh, nothing dangerous. And if we call the preview method of the data store object, we we get this nice preview. And we haven't actually imported or read any data into MATLAB. So this is just a preview of the data. Now, the data store objects, they are quite convenient. So, um, and if I wanted to actually read some data from this location, this folder where I have all these CSV files, I could use, for example, the um, read command on the data store, create a new variable called data. And then if I open up this variable and look at it in the variable editor, we see the same, same kind of tabular view. And now that I called read, I actually read the data from the first file. And now my data store is actually pointing to the second file in my data store. And if I read again, you can see that the data changes. So the load values change, and that's because I'm reading the second file. And now my data store is pointing to the third file. So this is a very nice way to kind of iterate and quickly read data from your, uh, from the location. And if I wanted to go back and start reading from the beginning, I can just call reset data store. Okay. Um, well, now that we have this data here, I can start exploring the data. So I can maybe uh, select the timestamp on the x-axis and hold down my control key and then click the load, go to the plots and visualize the data. And let's just zoom in a bit into this data. Sorry. There we go. And we see that it, it looks a bit weird. Um, and that's because we have these um, repeated timestamps here. So we have a measurement for the same, same time from all these 11 different regions. So we have midnight, we have the same timestamp here and so on. So um, yeah, I think this is something that we would like to, like to fix in the future. Um, so this data set, so one file, it's actually not that big. So it's only like something like 160 kilobytes. So we can actually call the read all function to bring all of this data into MATLAB all at once. Uh, so now MATLAB is basically reading or importing the data from all those 365 files and putting it into this variable NYISO raw. And it takes a few seconds because MATLAB is basically opening uh, almost 400 files. And here we see the first rows of the data set. So looks familiar. But we saw that we have these repeated timestamps. So what I would like to do is to kind of reorganize this data 
so that we have these we have the load values for these different regions in in their own separate columns and this is called unstacking so i can basically uh, yeah I, i'll just use the unstack command in matlab and um, basically the name variable or, or the kind of unique values of the name they become their own separate columns and i think that's more clear when you actually see the result here. So now we have these different measurements from different regions in, in their own separate columns. And now we don't have that repeated timestamp. So we only have like one unique timestamp. All right, so now if I, yeah, I can have a look at the unstacked data. And now I could actually go ahead and take one of these regions and plot the data. And now we see actually one year worth of data for this particular region that I selected. So we see that the energy demand is highest during the summer months, or at least on the Northern Hemisphere summer months. Um, and that's probably because people are using a lot of air conditioning. Um, and maybe during the winter months, they're using a lot of heating. So we see this kind of local maxima uh, appearing. Um, if I zoom into the data, we actually see the um, weekly behavior. So you know, I think it's somewhat obvious here that we have these like slightly lower peaks and those are during the weekends. And then we have these groups of five, which are the weekdays. But yeah, it's a very cyclic, cyclic behavior. But we do have like different trends. So we have the yearly or monthly trend and we have these like weekly trends. OK. Um, yeah, so let me actually at this point, let me go back to the slides. So yeah, I used data stores to access the data, large quantities of data, but you can also use it to uh, access one huge file or yeah, I mean, I mean, I had a lot of a lot of small files, but you can also use data storage to access big files. Um, and we actually do have multiple different types of data stores for different types of data. So we have image data store for images. We have database data store for databases. Uh, but if you have a like a very exotic file, uh, but if you have a way to read the data from that file, you can actually also define custom data stores. Uh, so you just need to provide your own custom reading function. Um, yeah, and it's a very convenient way to iterate uh, through the data. Right. Um, so as I mentioned, so this is basically time series data that we're working with. Um, and what I would like to do next is to basically convert my table data type into something called a timetable. And that's a really convenient data type to work with time series. For example, I can use this. Uh, is regular function to quickly check if if my sampling rate or if the sampling interval is regular or not. So let's execute this section, and from this I get a logical zero. So MATLAB says that it's you know it's not regularly sampled, and we actually see that over here as well. So the time series starts uh, with regular sampling rate, but then we have these irregularities here. So that's actually quite clearly visible. So, th so that's also something that I would like to fix uh, moving forward. And if we just look at the unique sampling intervals, so we use the diff function on the timestamp uh, and tabulate that, we see that we have pretty much <laughs> all the possible values for the sampling intervals. So we're like starting from one second, going all the way to the maximum value, one hour, five minutes. But it looks like most of the values are sampled at uh, five minute intervals. So that's maybe the intended uh, sampling rate. OK, so what I want to do next is to basically force my data set to be at this five minute interval. And I can do that by using something called retiming. And what you see here is basically you don't see code here. And what you see here is something we call a live task. 
So it's a small interactive app that you can actually place into your MATLAB scripts. And um, when these were first introduced, I didn't actually like these at all. I think they were kind of clumsy, but since then I have actually started to like them because even if you are a good programmer, you know how to use MATLAB commands and you know MATLAB is high level language. It's easy to do things programmatically, but sometimes you have to go into the documentation and you know read the documentation and that might take a few minutes. But using these live tasks, what I see is the biggest value is that you don't have to look at the documentation because it's so obvious. You just, you know, it kind of guides you uh, through the workflow. So here we simply need to select our input table that we want to read time. Then I can specify the new times. So I, I say that, okay, I want to go every five minutes. And then because we have irregularly sampled data, it means that whenever we put a sample at the five minute mark, and if there's no existing sample there, we need to estimate the value in place of that sample. So we can use different kinds of interpolation methods to uh, put a value um, in there. So basically, yeah, estimate a value. So yeah, let me run this. And by the way, you can uh, put these live tasks into your script. If you go to the insert tab in MATLAB and here you see uh, a large collection of tasks. So there's there are tasks uh, related to pre-processing data, uh, managing tables and timetables, and you'll see me use synchronize. What else? Yeah, you could also do the unstacking uh, using these interactive apps. And we used the read time right now. Right. So yeah, here we see the outputs, and now we see that we have nice five minute intervals across the entire data set. And um, this one confer confirms that. So 100% of the samples are sampled at five minutes. Great, so um, yeah, let's then do some quick visualization. So let's just use the plotting command to take one of these regions and examine how it looks like. So I think I already saw in the previous visualization that there were some outliers there. And here we see those quite clearly that for some reason we have these weird values here. These are essentially, yeah, I think they are like zero values. Yeah. So for some reason, you know, we have a couple of values that go all the way to zero and that shouldn't be possible, especially if they're like just isolated samples. So um, maybe we also want to fix those. So the strategy that I'm using here is to basically tell MATLAB that whenever I see a zero value, consider that as a missing value. So replace those zero values as um, missing values. And then I can use the clean missing values live task to fix that or basically estimate um, or replace those missing values with an estimate. So again, we just choose our input data. We take the downward column. This is one of the regions and we'll replace um, that column with the uh, new values, which might be partially estimated. And we can once again use linear interpolation to fix those values. So let's run this task. And here we see that we have now basically two values uh, uh, replaced. So let's look at the visualization maybe more closely to see how the, those values were estimated or if they make sense. So here we see the estimated value that used to be a zero value and it looks like to be looks looks to be a reasonable estimation. So that's good. Okay, so um, that was just an example how you can pre-process the data, you know, access data using data stores and clean the data using live tasks, uh, fill the missing values. Um, you can also choose, so when you put these live tasks into your script, you can also choose to um, look at the code. So this is actually the code uh, behind that live task. So 
yeah, like I said, it's not too difficult to do things programmatically. So the main uh, command here is fill missing. Um, but then, you know, there are many different ways you can use this function. So, you, you know, you may need to go to the documentation of MATLAB and look at like what kind of um, parameters uh, you would like to use. But the most of the code is actually uh, producing the visualization for the results. Okay. Now, um, we also had another piece of the data and that was the weather data. So, so far we've been working with the historical energy data. So uh, let's go ahead and um, access the weather data. So in a similar fashion, we can basically uh, download the data from the from some kind of weather service. Um, I have commented out this piece of section because it actually takes a lot of time to download the data. So I already have it on my on my computer, so I don't need to do that. Uh, and as in a similar way, I can use the data store to access the data. So just pointing to the folder, um, and then yeah, I want to look at the uh, weather data from 2019. So I'm using this wildcard, and again, we can use the preview to kind of get an idea and understanding of the data. Um, so this is what the weather data looks like, and we can see that there's much more columns in the data, and it's much more messy. We have missing values and and so on. So yeah, let's let's do some pre-processing. Um, the actual columns that we need for our analysis and and to develop our model, we simply need the temperature data, and also we need um, the date so that we can synchronize and combine the um, energy data and the weather data and we also need the station id uh, so that we can find the station which is located in in that particular um, region of the state of new york so um, yeah let's use the data store object to select just four columns from the data and let's do some preview so here's what it looks like um, and the temperature values, um, so this is something that I needed to check on the uh, on the weather service website. Uh, the temperature is represented in such a way that this is basically in degrees Celsius. And it's multiplied by 10. So this value here is actually 6.7 degrees Celsius. And then this comma and this number here, this is just some kind of an identifier. And it's a string variable, so we see the double quote, quotes here, so we can use some string uh, manipulation to extract this temperature. Um, but this weather data, this actually is, this can potentially be very big, um, especially yeah, if I used a bigger, bigger data set across multiple years, it can be very large. And we saw that you know, we have dozens of columns um, in the files. So in order to tackle big data and work with potentially data that doesn't fit into the memory of your computer, I can use something called tall arrays. Um, so what I'm doing here is that I'm simply taking my data store and then converting that into something called a tall array. Now, what are tall arrays? So let me go back to the slides and explain what they are. So it's a data type that was designed to work with out of memory data, something that potentially doesn't fit into the memory of your computer. So if you try to import that data, you might get out of memory errors. Um, you access or you typically create tall arrays um, using, or you create them from data stores. And it's actually the data store that defines how you, how eventually you'll read uh, data when you're processing tall arrays. Um, tall arrays, they can have any number of observations, billions, hundreds, hundreds of billions. Uh, we don't care, uh, but that's why we call them tall arrays. Uh, but in MATLAB, they look like just normal MATLAB tables or matrices. And you can use most of the built-in MATLAB functions and also many functions in uh, different toolboxes like the statistics and machine learning toolbox. So you can develop AI applications using tall arrays. So tall arrays, they might 
or, or, or the data that you access using Tolerate, they might, that data might not fit into the memory of, a, of your computer. So what MATLAB does is that it automatically chunks or kind of divides the data set into smaller pieces that do fit into the memory for a computer, and then it processes uh, those smaller chunks. But MATLAB does keep track of the intermediate results, and once it's processed all the smaller chunks, in the end, it will combine the results and give you the result that you're expecting. Uh, the processing code is the same, so yeah, um, you can use the same commands. Um, and you can also speed up the processing using parallel computing. So if you have multiple CPUs on your computer and you have the parallel computing toolbox, uh, you can basically uh, process multiple chunks um, at the same time. And if you have access to a computer cluster, um, that obviously can further speed up the process, especially if you're working with um, data sets that are terabytes in size. So that's what the tall arrays are. So basically, yeah, what I'm what I'm doing here is that I'm create, creating a tall array, but then I can use the same standardized missing command um, to basically deal with these weird values um, like this one. And then I'm just using the RM missing, remove missing value to you know, remove those missing values. And then I'm just using some string processing to extract the temperature value. So I'm using the extract before function or method of the string class, extract anything before the comma, and then convert that into double and divide by 10. So that's then our temperature value. Um, what else? And then I'm also calculating the mean value uh, for the temperature, both for the dry bulb and the dew point temperature. Um, this is not something that we actually need, but this is just for um, for demonstrational purposes. So now I executed this code and it actually ran quite fast. And then if I look at this, um, the result from the mean computation MT, that's actually, it says that it's unevaluated. And this is because uh, you have to explicitly tell MATLAB when to actually start computing these results. Uh, so before you do that, MATLAB actually just keeps a recipe or keeps track of the operations that you want to do with the tall array. And then when you actually uh, execute these commands, and you do that by using this function called gather. So if I want to gather this um, computation result, uh, you use syntax like this. So this will actually then start computing the results. And the reason why you need to do this is because MATLAB is trying to optimize or minimize the number of passes it needs to do uh, through the data. Um, so it tries to be as efficient as possible or quick as possible. So it might actually compute multiple results um, uh, when you're running through the data. But here we see the results. So these are the mean values for the dry bulb and the dew point temperature. And um, we actually use some filtering already here. So when I access the data, I accessed only the 2019 data. So it's actually not that big. So I could use the gather for the entire um, tall array. So this will basically import all of the weather data into MATLAB's memory. But this technique, this technique of using tall arrays, this would work. You could actually process data on your laptop, even if the data was 30 terabytes in size. It would take long, potentially, but you wouldn't at least get any out-of-memory errors. All right. Um, now, in the interest of time, so let me skip the subsequent steps in processing the weather data, because the steps are quite similar to um, to processing the energy data. So there's not much new new things there. So uh, I'm just going to hop over a few sections. And from here on, I'm just going to assume that I have cleaned up weather data and I have cleaned up um, energy data. So what I now need to do is to synchronize these two tables. So the other data, the weather data is, is sampled at one hour. Um, 
sampling intervals, whereas the energy data is at five minute intervals. So how do I synchronize those? So once again, I can use one of these live tasks to do that. So I just select my tables or timetables that I want to synchronize. And then I can choose how do I want to synchronize? So in this case, I want to take the intersection of those two tables. And this means that I'm actually discarding quite a lot of observations from the energy data. So the resulting table will have um, a sampling interval of one hour. So let's run that. So now we see that our sampling interval is one hour, but we have basically now combined uh, the energy data. So we have the energy consumption for these different regions and at the last columns we have the uh, temperature data. So we have the dry bulb and the dew point temperature for all these different regions. Now, as you saw from the dashboard that I used, all these different regions, the energy demand behaves in a different way. Um, so we should probably model these different regions separately. So what I'm doing here is that I'm taking one of these regions or the data for one of these regions. Let's take the New York City, for example. And for now, we can discard um, the data from the rest of the regions. So let's take that data. And then we can add these additional predictor values. So we can kind of start uh, extracting information um, that affects the energy demand. So we knew that the hour of the day that uh, affects the energy demand, the month of the year. Um, so I can just take my um, date variable in, the, in my table and I can just extract the hour or the month and I can put that into a new column in my data set. Um, similarly, I can just extract the weekday. So this is a number ranging from zero to six. Um, and then we can also check whether it's a weekend or not. So this is just like a logical, logical variable, zero or one. So let's run that. So this is now what our data set looks like. So we have the load, we have the hour of the day, month, day of week, and then a logical variable, whether it's a weekend or not. Um, finally, we, we saw that there's a heavy correlation. So the pattern tends to repeat itself um, across the different um, days of the year. There's some slight uh, trends uh, due to the different months, but there's a heavy correlation. So what I would like to do here is to examine the autocorrelation of the load value. So I can just use the xcore function cross correlation. And if I just pass the load data and nothing else, it will basically calculate the autocorrelation for, uh, we can say 200 hours. So that's kind of the lag range uh, for the autocorrelation. And if we plot the autocorrelation function, this is what it looks like. Um, so the correlation is 100% uh, with the data itself with no any kind of shifting. Uh, but here we have a local maximum. And this is basically, yeah, at lag 24 hours. So there's almost 100% correlation uh, with the load value, with the load value shifted 24, hour, 24 hours ago. And here we see another local maximum. And this occurs uh, exactly 168 hours ago. And this translates to seven days ago. So as additional predictors to our data set, we can, we can use the uh, load values 24 hours ago and 168 hours ago. So I'm just adding two additional uh, variables, prior day load and prior week load. And that's just the load value shifted by 25, uh, 24 hours and 168 hours. And this is now what our final uh, data looks like. So we have all the predictors in place, and now we can actually start developing an AI model. So we want to train a model that can uh, 
based on these predictors, we want to estimate the load value. Okay. Now, one of the challenges, the challenges in machine learning is that there are dozens of different types of machine learning models. You have deep learning models, you have different types of classical machine learning models. How do you find the model that gives you the most accurate results? Um, and to help in exploring different kinds of models, we have introduced these different interactive apps uh, to train multiple models. And in our case, we have a regression problem. So we're trying to forecast a continuous variable or continuous value, that's the load. Um, and for training regression models, we have something called regression learner. So this is an interactive app that kind of guides you through the process of uh, training different types of regression models. So, here it is and the first thing we need to do is to import some data so we have the table in the MATLAB workspace and we just need to select the input that's the data for the state of New York and the response that we're trying to predict is the load and the rest of the variables are predictors and then I can choose a validation scheme. I can use either cross-validation, simple holdout validation, or resubstitution. Um, this is a critical part in any kind of data-driven modeling. You always should use some kind of validation. In the interest of time, let's use just simple holdout validation and let's start a session. So here we see the response plot. So this is just uh, the values that we're trying to predict. And uh, let me make this slightly bigger. This is probably the most interesting thing here in this drop down menu. This is where you see a few dozen different types of machine learning models for regression. We have regression trees, we have support vector machines, Gaussian process regression models, SVMs, different types of ensembles, and neural networks. So what I can basically do is that I could train all of these models with the same data set and then examine which one of those models is the most accurate one. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to take um, a few models that MATLAB thinks are, thinks are quick to train. And let's train those, those models. Um, so just click the play button. And here I can also leverage parallel computing to um, speed up the training pro process. So I have four uh, physical CPUs on my computer so I can train four models at the same time. And I think in a few seconds we should start seeing some, some results. So the linear regression model that finished uh, the uh, couple of the uh, regression trees, they also finished. And from experience, I think this uh, regression tree with more nodes in it, I think that's going to be the most accurate one. Yes, that's correct. So yeah, we see the accuracy uh, defined by the root mean squared error value. So that's calculated between the predicted values and the uh, actual values. We can of course look at the response, the actual and the predicted values. Uh, this one is a bit fuzzy, it doesn't, it's not very, useful but i think this one is quite useful this where we basically use a scatter plot to plot uh, the true values against the predicted values and if we had a perfect model all of these blue markers would fall on this black diagonal line so it's not a perfect model but i think it's actually quite good model so the um, there's not too much variation and there's no obvious biases here so i think i think for now we can settle with this this model and you can also further tune these models. So most of these models, they have different types of hyperparameters that, that you can tune to make the model even more accurate. And you can actually do that in the, in the same, same tool. So if you choose the optimizable model, uh, that's where you can basically do the hyperparameter tuning. But let me go ahead and export this model into MATLAB's workspace. Give it a name trained model. 
Okay, let's close this one. And now we can actually do some further testing. So what I'm doing here is that I'm dividing my data set into different kind of training and testing data. And then we can basically <clears throat> use our trained model, um, pass in the testing data and then make some predictions. And let's plot the predictions against the actual values. And we see that our model can follow the trends quite nicely. So there's some fluctuation here, but overall it's a, I think it's a pretty good model. Okay, um, so that was actually pretty much all that I wanted to show you in MATLAB. So yeah, we accessed different types of data. We uh, use some big data processing techniques like the tall array, and then to explore different kinds of machine learning models, you can use interactive apps like the regression learner. So really, you don't have to have a higher degree in machine learning to um, start developing your own models. So, um, so that was the modeling step. Now we only have the deployment step um, left. So let me go back to the slides and describe you what kind of deployment options uh, we have. So we actually have two different paths for deployment. So if you're targeting embedded hardware, um, so if you want to deploy your MATLAB algorithm, algorithms on microcontrollers or PLCs, uh, or those, those kind of equipment or uh, hardware, uh, you can use the so-called coder products to actually translate your MATLAB code into other programming language like C, C++. Um, and yeah, this literally translates your MATLAB code into something else. But then we have the other approach, which, which is more valid for uh, targeting servers or cloud environments. And this is uh, by using the so-called compiler toolboxes. So with MATLAB compiler, you can generate web apps that people can access through their web browsers. You can package apps into Docker containers and so on. And then with an additional tool toolbox called Compiler SDK, you can generate um, different types of software libraries that you can integ integrate with other, other software like Python applications, for example. Um, so Compiler SDK, it doesn't translate your MATLAB code, so it just wraps your MATLAB code into a suitable um, artifact like a Python library or a Java library. Uh, with the MATLAB compiler SDK, you can also create microservices. So you can basically automatically create a Docker container that includes uh, your application, the MATLAB runtime, and it also creates an HTTP endpoint automatically to your Docker container that you can run anywhere, and you don't need to have a license for MATLAB. Uh, for this um, Spotfire application that you saw me using in the beginning, um, so the front end was developed in Spotfire, but in the back end, we were actually using something called MATLAB Production Server. So MATLAB Production Server is, it, it is software that you can install on um, virtual machines in the cloud or some on-premise servers. Um, and Production Server essentially exposes your MATLAB algorithms as a scalable uh, web service that you can call through REST API, for example. And that's a turnkey solution. So it's a very convenient way of uh, deploying your MATLAB applications. Okay, so I think we're coming to the end of the presentation. So we just have a few minutes left. So what I wanted to convey is that using MATLAB, you can access you know, uh, different data from different sources. So we support business data sources, engineering data sources, things like OPC servers or um, things like OSI soft Pi servers and, and things like that. Um, and you don't have a PA, need to have a PhD in machine learning to develop AI models. So you can use the interactive apps like the regression learners to quickly explore different types of AI models. And finally, our deployment options allow you to deploy MATLAB analytics in a very flexible way. So you can deploy to embedded hardware or cloud environments. And just as a side note, um, even machine learning applications, so 
models like what I just developed in MATLAB, you could actually convert those into C++ code as well. Okay, um, so yeah, thank you very much for attending. Uh, and I think we have a few few minutes for, for questions if, if you have any. Um, Auntie, I see there's one in the chat from Charles. He's asking, how do you know and ensure that the model is not overtrained? Right. Um, so I think that's when um, you, you can find out by using validation. So you would basically train your model um, with a subset of your data set. And then you would basically, and you, you get a certain kind of accuracy for your model with the training um, data. But then once you have trained the model, you test the model with uh, a testing set. And if you get similar accuracy with a testing set, I think it's fairly safe to say that um, your model is well generalized and it's not overfit. So validation is the, is the key. Thank you for the question. Very, very good question. Any other questions? If not, then I'll wish you a very pleasant day. And I guess it's also lunchtime in South Africa. So yeah, have a very good day. And uh, I'm sure the folks at uh, Optinum can answer any additional questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Auntie.